Today's program features one of the most prolific directors and important thinkers and rebels of our time, Oliver Stone. This is part two of a two-part conversation. On this segment, Oliver discusses politics in the U.S., forthcoming documentary projects, the film business, including stories about Michael Cimino, Al Pacino, Sidney Lumet, and others. Oliver also talks about the challenges and successes in writing Conan, Scarface, and Year of the Dragon, plus the ups and downs of making Salvador and Platoon, his crowning achievement. The stories we discuss today can be found in Oliver's recently released biography, Chasing the Light. Check it out. It's an excellent book. All right, Vincent. Let's give it a shot. But an hour only, you tend to, you go way too long. I, Oliver, I, I, uh, I actually, I went back and listened to our previous interview, uh, again. And, uh, I did, I did try and end it when you tried to end it and, uh, you, you continued. The oh, really? Yeah. Okay. You, <laughs> um, but and I will, so, I'll, I'll be very sharp on it this time. I, uh, yeah, because I just have, I'm way behind on my, on my reading and my writing and everything. And I'm just feeling very guilty. You know, that feeling I do. Do you know the feeling when you have a de- when you feel like you should be doing something and you're talking and talking and talking and I don't know, it's a horrible guilt feeling writers get. Would you rather do it another time? No. Okay. No, no. I'd like to talk to you a lot. I think you're terrific. And I was talking to, uh, to uh, my friend uh, Dan Jerson this week who said, I said, you know, there's a guy you should meet. And he said he met you already. So it's kind of like preordained that you would run into another vet who's a very smart man. He was in Afghanistan. You're in Iraq. I was. I interviewed him about a week ago. First time we connected. Yeah, I heard. So you, you know a man of, I think he's of some value to this movement. I suggested that he organize with you and me a trip to Washington, D.C. to protest at the inauguration of uh, Biden, the, uh, the war and uh, the continuation of these wars, because Biden has to hear it. He's such a schmuck. Uh, I, I had to hold my nose. He going He's calling the, the leader of the Russian Republic a thug. Like, you know, he has no concept of foreign policy, it seems to me. No, it's very, uh, it's very dangerous. I held my nose. I'm trying to be as strategic as possible until November 3rd. And on November 4th, it's coming off. I mean, we've got to, if we don't go after them on his stance on Russia and his stance on China and Iran, we'll be in another war within a couple of years. Well, you're up against the neocons, you know, there. That's who he they, surrounded himself with. Well, they've got themselves a hell of a, yeah. Who's going to be a secretary of state? I don't know. Exactly. You have any idea? No, there's been some names floated, but to be honest with you, um, I, I apparently the one that's, there's a girl called Michelle Flory. Was talk, they're talking about Defense Department. You know yeah. about that? Yep. He scares the shit out of everybody. <laughs> I, I don't know what you... Every name women, that they've brought up has scared the shit out of me when it comes to foreign policy. The women, they, these women are very dangerous. Samantha Power, they, she's one of the most dangerous that's ever existed. What about Susan Rice? Susan Rice. Rice. Now, there's a woman who left the national security apparatus and then sat on the board of directors of Lyft and fucked over gig workers for the last five years. The board of who? The board of directors of Lyft. It's like an Uber uh, competitor. Yeah, she sat on the board of directors for them and proceeded to, uh, you know, put down union efforts and make sure that the workers still get fucked around. So, you know, you get it on both ends. They're terrible abroad and they're terrible to people at home. Yeah. How's your, how's your, our interview coming? Are you shaping it or what? What you wanted it to finish some questions? I, I, I wanted this one to, uh, we ended with you in New York, your grandmother passing away. I wanted to start in 1976. You're back in Los Angeles. You get your lucky break from Marty Bregman. You know, Sidney Lumet and Al Pacino are into it, Platoon. Um, and I want people to get, because I think this is one of the themes of the book that interests me the most, is this right when you thought you made it, you made it, you're at the top of the world with Midnight Express. You're in LA. Here's my last shot. I'm going to really go at it. Um, you know, and it's one challenge and failure and up and down. And right when you get something good at every time in the book, when you get something good, there's something equally bad that happens or another challenge that takes place. And I, to me, that is one of the main themes of the book that I took away or that I found inspiring. Uh, well, when you have no hope, when you're at the bottom of the barrel, which, which is where I was at 30 with uh, the Orwell kind of down and out in Paris, uh, I, I use that analogy down and out 
it was it in Paris? I think, yeah. And uh, then I moved into my phase of Henry Miller, which was much more light hearted and had a great time. And it really did me wonders because it gave me a more humoresque approach to my disasters. <laughs> <laughs> my roommate uh, at that time was this, uh, this uh, Welshman who was kind of crazy and he had the real up and down approach to life too. So, and uh, all the artists in New York at that time, the seventies, the drugs, the, the life, the, the, the easy fucking, the, it was insane. Uh, and I loved it. And it taught me a lot because I'd been cooped up in my marriage, uh, I suppose repressed in some ways in this marriage for six years. So, you know, I wanted, I, I really cut loose and, and had a good time. And so these were crumbs I got, you know, these were major crumbs, but they, put it this way. There's a, feast put out there by Bregman and Pacino and Lament. It's so exciting. Uh, so that when it crumbles into the, the fish bones, I'm still grateful that I'm in another category now. It's just, I'm no longer in the bohemian world of New York as much as I am in a new kind of existence. And the money was good enough to get a small apartment, you know, and these kind of things make a big difference. So, you know, and a lot of screenwriters and Hollywooders basically eking it out too. And your friends exist in that circle. So yeah, no question. It was a step up for me. So I didn't see it like I have to hit, I have to have a movie. I wanted the movie, but I didn't see the long road of crumbs ahead. And I didn't see the long time period that was coming. You don't live it. I didn't know it was going to be 10 years. Right. I didn't know that. So I'm very happy at this point. Very happy. Uh, okay. They didn't make platoon, but I got this, I got Midnight Express. Okay, uh, they didn't treat me really nice on Midnight Express, but they were happy with it and I'm hot. So everything's a little step up, you know. That's the way I look at it, that whole period. Yeah. And that's important. You have to feel like you're getting better or that you're improving or that life is turning out. And of course, you're surrounded by people who are not su succeeding too, you know. There's a lot of broken dreams in LA. Uh, you You should know that from... I don't know where, where do you live, by the way? I, I'm in Michigan City, Indiana. <laughs> I'm at the pinnacle of American culture in Northwest Indiana here on the shore of Lake Michigan. <laughs> Indiana is pretty wild, yeah. I, I flew back, I arrived on, I arrived on, oh, I forgot. Yeah, I arrived Saturday, but it's been a hard week to get, when you're away for two weeks, everything just stacks up. Uh, yeah, I waste a lot of time reading courteously reading a lot of shit from a lot of people the very good stuff but it just doesn't it's not going to make i'm not going to make it so i spent a lot of time reading and writing uh courtesy letters and oh you can't understand all that but i have to get back to nuclear doc my nuclear energy documentary uh and i have to get on top of these things because it's a it's a hard piece to write in the sense that it's technical material and it bores people so I, I'm trying to simplify and make it fun to listen to this. It's, I'm trying to be Dr. One of those, who is it? Mr. Rogers or something, trying to explain <laughs> uh, something to, to kids. It's not easy, yeah. but it's an important subject. Yes, it is. Probably Very the most important subject of our time, that and nuclear weapons. Yes. And uh, I, those two presidential candidates, at least Biden, had some sense of oil and uh, being evil. And at least he, you know, he, nobody mentioned coal, but you know, God, yeah. to see our president, so our president, the debates are so fundamentally ignorant and, and uh, geared to the lowest common denominator. It's depressing to see that. It's tragic. I mean, I, I and it's fun. Most tragedies are, are comedies, of course, but this time around, I'm, I'm having a hard time laughing about what's happening. Yeah, I remember the Kennedy-Nixon debates. That's funny. When I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. It just seems that it's just very hard on television. Uh, the, uh, I guess it was this way in Athens, in ancient Athens. I don't think there was much different. Do you think politics has ever been intelligent? I don't know. I don't know. Perhaps in different times. I think in different times, in different spaces, it is. I mean, if you look at the political discourse in this country, 
just 40 or 50 years ago. I mean, look at a, a William F. Buckley and a Noam Chomsky debate from 1967 on uh, firing line. And then look at the kind of debates that you see on TV today. I, the level of discourse is in the, in the tubes today. It's nothing like the discourse that even took place. I'm not sure you're right. I'm not sure you're right. Nobody watched Buckley in those days. That was a very limited show. You know, I'm talking about the mass debate. This is a mass debate. Yeah. I don't know how you can have one. I mean, they, they fucking, they poisoned Socrates, you know. Right, right. Socrates was actually a big anti-Democrat, you know. He, he didn't believe in democracy at all. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, they didn't like that, you know. Yeah. Well, he and asked too they, many questions. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had to drink the hemlock. Yeah, I mean, when they talk about Putin as a thug, and I, you know, what's the point? Am I even trying to make an intelligent movie about him? I mean, you, you, like, they don't know anything about him. He's just a thug. That's all. Thug, thug, thug. That's what I hear. Every dictator is a thug. <laughs> well, an unwillingness to engage in dialogue or even consider another person's perspective. I'll tell you the truth, and you're smart enough to realize it. If Putin were a dictator in the old fashioned sense of the word, and he did, and he were unpopular, he'd be out within a month or two. You can't survive in Russia unless you have the popular will. That's, that's a fact. And there is a popular will. It's expressed not necessarily through elections, but through a general zitgeist. Yeah. And well, I've we, watched as Sergio has tried to explain. What? I've watched as Sergio has tried to explain to our left-wing friends for the last 10 years uh, what Putin means to people in Russia. And so of course, Sergio has a nuanced view. It's not that he glorifies him, um, but he, I've sat there for many years and have listened to Sergio have some really engaging and, and interesting and sometimes very frustrating debates with liberals, progressives, and leftists who uh, I think do have a sense of uh, Trump derangement syndrome. They have a, a sort entitled, of- Entitled to their worldview, yep. privileged worldview. It's a Russophobia. And yeah, that's an old, that's an old one. That's, it's very bad. Well, it reminds me of the uh, Bob Dylan song with God on our side. I think, you know, it's like the Russians were our, our friends. Now they're our enemies. And yeah, but then our artists should speak up. Our artists should speak up. They should. Like Katie Hepburn did in the forties or there should be, they you know, what's, be <laughs> you know, what's horrific, Oliver, you know, who speaks up more than artists today? Athletes. You'll get more poli- you you get more protests from the professional athletes yeah, today. The black thing, that's all it is. It doesn't go beyond that. Oh, I don't right, see athletes right. taking a position on nuclear. I don't see athletes doing anything beyond their limited self interest. Yeah, that's true, and that's a great point. All right, well, we got to get to the uh, second part of the book, or else yeah. you're going to yell at me for going more than sixty part. minutes. It's all part of a pie, isn't it? It is. It is. But I. I how do I put this? I wanted to touch on some things maybe that people, in other words, I've looked at so many of your interviews that it seems like there are things that, you know, you've been asked or that you've talked about in the past. And I was really trying to maybe hit some of the things that hadn't come up in previous. Please meetings. sell the book for Christ's sake. That's what, I, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do, brother. <laughs> um, I was surprised to read in the book that uh, Billy Friedkin was going to be the original director of Born on the Fourth. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. And of course, he's a Chicago guy. Oh, really? I thought he really fell off a lot. I mean, I like To Live and Die was one of his last good ones, I thought. I like Live and Die. I mean, I think Sorcerer is, uh, I love the Sorcerer. Oh, really? really? I, I, yeah, he was a failure, you know. Yeah. Because... It was completely extended. It was a, originally a, The Wages of Fear was a wonderful Henry Clouseau film from 1954. Very terse, Lino Ventura, Yves Montaigne. It's good. And Billy draw, just expanded it into this $70 million. I forget what he spent. He, at that time, it was $40 million. And Roy Scheider is not, is not is the, he can't carry that kind of picture. He could carry a Jaws, but not this. Yeah, and William Friedkin uh, admits to that. I watched a recent documentary with him. It's oh, like, yeah, which one? It just came out uh, this year, actually. It's called, shit, I think it's called like f- something Friedkin. It's just his name, and it just came out this year, and it's like a 90-minute documentary, uh, just a guy just straight talking to him, and it's excellent. Where did you see it? Do you remember? I think I saw it on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. My, um, I was going to mention that... Uh, my my dad's friend uh, Ricky Holly was actually a helicopter pilot. He worked on a couple of films with uh, 
Billy Friedkin, he actually died on a runaway train. His helicopter crashed and uh, he died on that set of that. He was a Vietnam, uh, a Vietnam vet who was a helicopter pilot, came back, got a gig from Friedkin and then worked on Blues Brothers, worked on a whole bunch of films. And then he died on a runaway train with uh, John Boyd. A lot of action in all those movies. So we're at this period when it's getting better. I mean, the boy, then he, from, uh, from Midnight Express, into Born on the Fourth of July. So it's always getting better and working with Friedkin again and, and learning a lot this time from Pacino because I saw the rehearsals and I went through the whole process of revisions and that was a hard script for me to write because it was, it was the most testing. It tested me the most. It was, but Ron helped me a lot because this was a very uh, sensitive and emotional script. Uh, Ron has a firm memory very firm of all the things that happen. It's like, it's, it's engraven in his mind. So he's very specific as to dialogue even sometimes. So that's why it helped me a lot. I didn't have confidence when I started it because I didn't know that world and I learned a lot on it. So that was a big experience. So I kept learning, you understand? The whole thing works up to a point to the hand. I mean, there was also a Year of the Dragon experience, of, which was a little, which was, it was good for me because it was money and it was also status with a top director who was out of favor. But, but still, uh, I was cut out of that too because Michael uh, went on without me and I didn't mind, but I, I do think it would have benefited from more work. Uh, and uh, after that, it got, I was just a writer and I didn't want to be just a writer. Uh, the Eight Main Ways to Die experience was terrible was my script. I had a good script. They just, they turned it into a bloated Hollywood, typical, uh, ridiculous production where people were trying to make money for themselves. And uh, Hal Ashby was at the end of his game. But then after that, uh, I really gave up and I said, I'll go on my own and I'm going to make this fucking movie no matter what. And it was Salvador. That was where it all came to a head. Salvador was, was a crucible to go through. <laughs> As I wrote in the book. It, that reading through that period, that sounds horrific. As a writer, you're putting out all of this passion and ideas, and then you're separated from the very essence of, make, of turning that into something new, to that manifesting itself into a film on all of those. I mean, including uh, Year of the Dragon, which I went back and watched as well. I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, Michael Cimino, but, you know, he's another tragic figure. Um, I mean, the the... The passage in the book that you note that you raised $14 million for the guy and tried to help him out to make a film, and he still just said, hey, fuck it, it's not enough money at a time when he couldn't find any money in Hollywood. It's a really, it's an interesting, I mean, I find him interesting as well because the way he makes films, I've listened to a lot of interviews with him that I could find where he's, the, his sort of philosophy on getting people who aren't actors to play roles how he likes these big choreographed scenes. Just, I, I find him very interesting just listening to him talk about. Oh, he, had grand, he, he was a grand figure in the sense of his vision. He wanted to be in, I, I compare him to Napoleon because <laughs> there's something, uh, something irrational about him too. Yeah. No, I mean, it was never cut and dried. He never said, I don't want to, I don't, I need more money. I just, it was the process of dealing with him where things mess. There's a lot of agents and people in the middle and it just was never clear. I mean, here's the money, man. Go ahead. I, I got it. I, Mario said, do it. But why are we having problems? Why is it not? Something is wrong here. That's, that's the way it works. He's not, he's not sitting in front of me and saying, I can't do it at that price. But I, that's what I imputed from it. Gotcha. His demands were going up when he should have been grateful. And he made some really shitty films at the end there, I guess. They just, nobody wanted to see them. No. But, uh, I guess because he had, he got more money to do them. He was working with too many Dinos, you know? Yeah. Well, it seems like one of the, the sources of fuel to keep you going as well is that you see this, um, sort of changing tide in Hollywood with regard to Vietnam movies. So you're trying to make both movies. You have platoon, you have born on the 4th of July, but in the meantime, you're seeing apocalypse now come out. You're seeing deer hunter come out. You're seeing all these what did you make of them at the time? And it, even looking back now, what are some of your favorite movies, Vietnam movies, other than those that you've made? Well, as I wrote in the book, I, I was, I appreciated those two big movies. They were, they were good. And I accepted 
I, t- I write about it. I, the night that Deer Hunter won and I won for Midnight Express. That was a night I accepted that I should be happy. I got my little prize here. I got the second prize. And I should be, I mean, an Oscar at 33 is still a big deal. But, you know, the big, the big prize, the, the, the big kahuna goes to Deer Hunter for a, a very good, tense movie. Well acted, but not at all realistic at all. I mean, it was like some fantasy of the Vietnamese's, uh, uh, you know, it, very much in the Chuck Norris vein or uh, Sylvester Stallone. It's it's a, but it's an interesting thesis that you know because he ties in the homeland. They go back. One is one of them. It goes back or is completely fucked up. And he goes back to get him. That's all very interesting in a more subtle way than Rambo, where he goes back with a bow and arrow, but. Uh, by the way, I just, uh, this a side story. I just got a, a, the guy who produced Heaven and Earth, who was a jerk. You don't know his name, but he sent me a script yesterday or two days ago, and I looked at it last night. And it's the same story. It's about this real mission in 1980 to get the, to get the vets out again. And it's oh, a real mission. Jesus! In, in, the, in the story. There's a guy, there's an Indian with a bow and arrow who's very good with a bow and arrow. And he says, this is, he says it's all true. He used a bow and arrow to take out some guards in one of the prison camps. I, you know, this stuff goes on. Why it's, would he think that you would be interested in that? That's the kind yeah, of. Because he's kind of stupid, but he wants to make. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, it's very oh. funny. That it, happened, but, uh, it still goes on is what I'm saying is that it's recidivist. Uh, the thing I'll say about Deer Hunter, Oliver, is that the one of the, like Full Metal Jacket, Full Metal Jacket, I like up until the moment they leave boot camp. Um, I like I some of the stuff in Vietnam, you know, that, that there's portions of that that I find a little. Oh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. The first you? time I, I agree with you, I didn't find it realistic at all. And that was, you know, you have that first impression, not realistic, but that doesn't matter. It's a movie. Yeah. So I go along with the, I go with the fantasy aspect of it. And I enjoyed the whole thing. It, Kubrick's a great filmmaker. It was an excellent film, but not realistic. No. Although there was one thing that was good. It was the whole metaphor of the female sniper wiping out the whole fucking Marine group. I just loved that because it is true. That's what happened. That's the way you get people. They were very smart in the field. Very smart. They would do that. You could often be panicked out of your mind and you're facing one fucking sniper or two and you're acting crazy because they got you confused as to a crossfire, this, that. I, I talked about that in the book, yeah. uh, not per, perhaps not enough, but uh, the Vietnamese did significant damage. And I read after the war, years later, I read, you know, in the tunnels of Kuchi and films like uh, uh, books like that, there are stories of the Vietnamese side of what they, of the damage they did. And there is a female sniper in there too, who was laughing at it. She just, you know, yeah. it was, we were way over stuff. We were over armed like elephants in the jungle. Right. Easy right. targets, you know, easy targets. Yep. If you're if you're courageous and willing to take a risk, I mean, it's no fun when you get artillery or bombs on you, but uh, it, if you're willing to take that risk, you could do significant damage. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, the Deer Hunter uh, Apocalypse, they go by. You ask what the other films, there was a few others. Uh, I, I, I kind of like the Burt Lancaster one that wasn't, it was. I mean, I like Burt Lancaster. It was. It was. I forgot what it was called. I'm Spartan. Not... Oh, okay. Spartan. Okay. Uh, Ted Post directed that. I liked Rambo One to a degree because it was. It was more. It was not about going back. It was about the fact that he was misunderstood, and I, that had reson. I almost did that. I, somebody sent me this the book, and the book was good. Uh, there was. Uh, yeah, I read the book years ago. It's. It is a good book. If you named a few other films, I'd probably find one or two that I... So I accepted. In other words, they'll never make Platoon. They'll never make Born on the Fourth of July. Walk away, but here's the booby. Here's the second prize. I got Midnight Express. I should be happy. So I'm not, I'm not bitter about it, but I'm sad. Uh, I accept defeat, but I'm working. And I'm, ha- I'm, a, I'm at another level when I was... If I'd stayed broke, it would be a different ball game. Right. If I, <laughs> uh, and then, of course, came the hand, and the, 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 that was the, the hand is you should see it. You know, make up your own mind. I enjoyed the film. It's 
We talked about it a little bit last time. I noticed that you were the hobo in the film. I like Michael Caine. I think Michael Caine's character is great. I like all the commentary about his yuppie wife. Um, I like, there's a whole bunch of stuff I like in that film. And I, I, the, what you talk about in the book makes a lot of sense because I personally, what I, what I will say, and I, I don't even know if I have a place to say this. My favorite portions of the movie are when the hand is not there. So it's like, you know, as I read your, your take on it in the book, I was thinking, oh no, Oliver was right on. The less you have the hand in these scenes, the more believable it becomes, the more suspenseful, um, oh, that's partly my fault because I called it the hand as opposed yeah. to <laughs> psychological. Anyway, yeah, I, I talk about the pressure on me to make it more of a horror film right. and I could never solve that dilemma. And it's, although I do find the film scarier. And when I looked at it the other week, uh, I said, well, you know, the hand is not bad. It's just, it's, it's not badly done. It's, it's very hard that fight, that stage fight in the garage at the end. It's a very good fight. Yeah. And well done, but I understand the conflict of absurdity. Well, and, and the in the final scene with Kane is is it's yeah. just phenomenal. I mean, he looks crazy in that scene. He, he did a great job, and although he didn't, he denigrates the film uh, in his. But that's Michael. He doesn't really. Uh, Michael goes off popularity. So if people didn't like it, he he doesn't like it. You know, that's the way he thinks. Uh, and I like Michael, but uh, no. That was a big setback. And of course the cocaine thing puts a shadow on it and it looks like, you know, I didn't handle it. It was a tough one because first films, much was expected of me. First films in Hollywood, much was expected of me. And was, there was a lot of jealousy because I'd won the Oscar early young. And, and I was a big guy who, you know, it wasn't like I was overly uh, aggressive, but I was, I was not scared and people, as I said, there was, there's a lot of jealousy in Hollywood. And I felt like after I'd failed with that film, uh, it, it was a psychological letdown for me and that more Coke, more Coke, more, more despair. And one thing after another, I realized I couldn't go on, uh, this way in Hollywood. I wanted to get out of there and Bregman saved my ass in a way because he didn't know it, but he wanted me, he didn't even know I was on Coke. He didn't care. He just yeah. wanted me to write Scarface and it just happened to be about a drug dealer. Right. So it, it kind of fit in and it, it, there was an element of fate there. And I enjoyed the whole process of writing Scarface in that way. Yeah. No, you, and it was, you wrote it when you weren't on Coke though. You were in Paris, you oh. had kicked it. You went back to Paris and you mentioned that just being in Paris, being surrounded by family and friends did a lot of good for you. I kicked it deliberately. I said, this has got to stop. Yeah. I'm going to, I can't do it in LA. I can't write it in Miami. I got to go to, I got, I moved my wife and me there and I had friends there and thank God. And it really, I, I went cold Turkey on the plane. I think it was, Yeah, that's yeah. not easy. No, I would uh, rank my previous addiction to cocaine probably right where you did around a five or a six. It wasn't destroying my life, but it was enough to where, you know, there was a problem. Yeah. And I'd written a screenplay called wilderness by Parker and Robert Parker. And I knew it wasn't up to my, I could do better. And I yeah. was pissed at myself. Yeah. That's what I started to notice was uh, different work I was doing was suffering. And that was enough for me to say, you know, what's more important, getting fucked up or the work you're doing. And it was, you know. <laughs> yeah. How about, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Conan, because what I found interesting in the book that I didn't know, first of all, Milius is definitely a character. I mean, I've always known that. I've seen some documentaries about him. I've seen interviews. He's fascinating, but also a nut when it comes to thoughts about you know, his thoughts about violence and, and these things I think are a little, uh, Oh yeah. You know, I don't know if he was kidding or not half the time. Yeah. Right. But now I realize that he did worship Curtis LeMay who is an asshole. I'm sorry. Yeah. Curtis LeMay is an asshole. Maybe he was a courageous man in world war two, but a complete monster in the sense that I do think he's involved in the murder of Kennedy. I do. And you'll see my new documentary. Uh, we make a few points about him. I didn't realize you were, first of all, you're a big fan of comics. You mentioned that as a kid, they played a big role. But then I didn't realize that Conan was going to be a 10 to 12 part series. That's way ahead of its time in terms of franchises. That's way ahead of its time in terms of, uh, you know, thinking of like developing this character, which it seems like people are doing now with the uh, TV series format more and more. 
Oh, it's now it's, it's conventional, but back then, no. Yeah. No, it was really a beautiful, it was, Howard was a very pulp, a great pulp writer, and he wrote at least 12, 10, 10, 12 books that were held water. There were stories that you got involved in. I read them all. Like, I, I loved Ian Fleming's stuff. I read them all too. So why not make it like, uh, you know, a James Bond? I mean, that was, it was, there had been franchise. That was a big one. Yeah. But why not make it? Now, I just didn't have, I couldn't, we didn't have the money to support a first time director on it. And Dino was a, was, was cut rate, a cut rate producer. He was not the guy for that. Right. And because it was a real opportunity. And Ed Presman and I, Ed was the producer originally. Ed knew it. I, I knew it. He hired, he'd, he'd been, had the foresight to hire Arnold for the, and that would have been perfect to, yeah. to go all the way. I'd probably still be making Conan's. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that would have changed a lot. I'm sure. Yeah. I'd be a trillionaire. <laughs> um, the, another thing I wanted to mention about Scarface because it's my dad's favorite quarterback of all time. And we grew up uh, sort of worshiping him in, including any other Italian American athlete that ever existed. Really? Oh God. If it was my dad would be like, do you know why he'd be like, you know who the best directors are? He'd be like, look at Scorsese. He'd be like, look at the best actors. They're Pacino. They're De Niro. He'd do the same thing with baseball, sports, all that shit, Oliver. But I didn't, that, I thought it was cool that you named his character. You took the last name of Joe Montana at the time. I thought it was pretty cool. Something people might not know as well. Montana. Yeah. No, it, uh, actually, Joe, uh, I liked Steve Young better in the end because I, I think Joe was the first one there. But frankly, as a quarterback, he was sturdier and he, and he was left-handed and he was, he was a runner too. So Joe was fragile, but he was certainly, I like Bill Walsh. I thought it was an exciting team. They had finesse and Bill developed a style of fluidity that they still have it. The 49ers, it just, when they, when they move, they go down the field. It's a pleasure to watch how they click when they, when they're on. Yeah. And that was a, that was Bill Walsh's conception. I think I, this I is I did any given Sunday too. I, well, I was, I was going to mention this. I, I was going to mention it later, but it breaks my heart, Oliver. And, uh, that if you go on YouTube and you type in the search box, Oliver Stone, any given Sunday, there is not one clip available of you talking about that film. Oh, yeah. Why is that? Uh, I, I don't know either, but there's not any other film you've done. There's like a few that there's nothing on. I would love to eventually talk to you about them just so we could put something out there. Cause I think it's crazy that there's no interviews, but talk radio is one any given Sundays, another and savages is the other savages. The only interviews you can find are five minutes or less any given Sunday. There's not one interview of you talking about it. And there's not one interview of you talking about talk radio. Well, don't you think it's up to the fans to do that? I think there are interviews out there. Certainly you could probably post one. I don't know. Well, I, I think it would be cool to get you to talk about them today because I think they were ahead of their time. Talk radio, first of all, because talk radio then, I think, through the 90s and 2000s play a significant role in our politics in the way that it unfolds. Rush Limbaugh, Fox News. I mean, to me, watching how that, how all of that plays out, that whole dynamic, I think, is interesting. And then the hatred that, could, you know, that can uh, people have as well. Uh, and same with any given Sunday. I remember the reaction to that. We were in high school watching and our friend, John Schaefer, we used to call Willie Beeman because he was this hot, flashy young quarterback. And I was thinking of that as you were talking about Montana and young, of course you have Quaid as the older quarterback who's getting injured. You got Willie Beeman coming up. He's flash, you know, he's flashy. He's young. Um, we used to call our friend, John Schaefer, Willie Beeman. But I remember when it came out. He's a third string quarterback, remember yeah, oh, that's right. That's right. He is the third string. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I stand corrected. It was ahead of its time because I remember the reaction to it was the NFL saying, oh, God, no, this isn't how things are. It, you know, the NFL is a wonderful organization. We, you know, we have all these wonderful values. And as time went on, uh, it became very clear and open to the public that, no, this is actually much more realistic than, you know, people thought it was. Well, the NFL is like the uh, military in that regard. It was very much a propaganda organization yeah. and they keep up completely positive front. Right. And as a result, they squelch everything in the army, like friendly fire, <laughs> yeah. like killing civilians. 
and the truth essentially the whole truth yeah and hyper militaristic i mean with the planes and the ties to the pentagon and all the nationalist stuff that goes on at the events there's a uh, yeah. you see in the advertisements on television recently for the military and the marines oh god they're, yeah they're in full warfare yeah they're feeding people i mean you don't see the enemy but you they're in full combat that's what's exciting they're selling combat yep. you can be in combat you can invade what some fucking island somewhere right one of the points i was going to make about midnight express was that this was your first time speaking out about the prison industry uh, so the overlap of like, you're feeling some of the first backlash. This is your big moment in Hollywood. You get the, the Oscar, uh, you make a uh, speech at the golden globes that year when you received it. And, and this was sort of your first taste of like, Oh, if I speak up and say something, maybe the wrong way, here's the reaction I'm going to get. Right. Absolutely. Right. It's, it was pretty uh, eye opening. And then what I find interesting is that along the way, midnight express prison industrial complex, you move into Scarface. Now you're thinking more about the war on drugs. What the hell's going on with this? Um, all the way up, obviously, until Sal into Salvador. It's opening. My eyes are opening. Yeah. And it culminates with Salvador and Platoon. Yeah. Salvador was an, all of a sudden I'm waking up to another war and I'm going to Central America with Boyle. And in every one of these countries, it's very clear that the United States has a presence there. And that there is an, a common goal here: get rid of the the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Get rid of them. That was where it was going. And there would have been an invasion or a, co a, a bigger war, like Vietnam. It would it crawls up, you know. It doesn't start big, but it crawl. And it would have happened if Reagan had not been busted at uh, in uh, by the Hassan Fus uh, incident, CIA incident in it was it October of eighty six. And the, the speech that, that uh, Boyle makes when he's sitting at the table with the general uh, and he's sitting at the table with the character who's wearing the polo shirt with the uh, sweater wrapped around him is like with the golden locks is, it's a perfect, <laughs> he's like the most perfect uh, State Department guy that you could have picked. <laughs> um, yeah, but the speech that he gives at that table, I mean, really sums it up. You know, uh, that was my last statement. I figured I'd never make another movie and this would be it. So I had to get it down and I knew it was speechy, uh, but I wanted to do it because it was a combination of what I'd been seeing. And also Boyle was also that of that ilk. Uh, Boyle would be the type of guy who could, who could think these things. He may not have said them, but so I wanted to put it all in because I really didn't think I'd get the, it would, I, I just had to do it one time because I'd been kind of frustrated on the um, Scarface. Yeah. They cut a lot of my, they cut a lot of my thought process out, but it was still in there. And if you look closely, it's in Scarface still. And, you know, you can see it growing, but honestly, I'm waking up. I'm yeah. waking up, but not enough, not enough. I'm waking up, but I'm waking up at my own pace. I'm moving at a different, slower pace, but, by the time I finished Platoon, and now I'm being re recognized for myself, not just a, a, a screenwriter. It really, it, that's what I say to myself at the Oscars. I, I, have, I realize there's, there's a bigger game here. It's not just Vietnam. It's not just Central America. It's a bigger game, and I'm scared of it. And honestly, I, it's going to take a little bit more effort on my part into the nineties to begin to really, and then JFK at 91 breaks it open, I think. Right. And then you really get, I'm sure this is going to be in the, the follow-up book to chasing the light, but then I'm sure you get the kind of backlash that you've probably never received before from anything oh, yeah. that you had made. For sure, for I sure. can't even imagine what the years following JFK looked like. Yeah, we could, we could go into that the next, the next time that you, uh, on the second, the second book that you write about this, I do want to bring up a special character because I think everyone in their lives have people who come across and give them opportunities or make something happen for them. Uh, and I think it's a really important thing that happens to all of us. Um, and, uh, John Daly is obviously that character for you. I mean, he's thanked in the book, but it's also, I mean, here comes a guy uh, who gets the money from Salvador. We still don't know where the money came from. Um, but he, 
he comes and says, Hey, look, you get, you're going to make, I got money for you to do both films. You do them how you want to do them, which you say is unheard of, uh, in Hollywood. And then, you know, this is a guy who really opened the door for you. I mean, he made it happen. He was, uh, he was the godsend and I dedicated the book to him, uh, without him, without him, I don't think anything will, I don't know if it would have happened the way it did because he was outside the system. He was an independent. He was a tough guy. He was, you know, an Englishman, first of all, a lower class. And he had the contempt for authority that I had, right. you know, for the establishment. Because in England, they have a, a class system. So he got it. He got what I was doing. Uh, he saw it and he appreciated it. Uh, he, he, he's quoted in the book as, you know, he understood that the passion was there. So I loved him for that. And, you know, at the time we had fights too, you know, like everybody else, but it was never easy making those movies. And he tried, as I said, he was, edit, he was, he considered himself an editor too. And that was always a difficult one for me with the Salvador story, but on platoon, we went all the way, you know, yeah. uh, I wish, I wish I could go back to that moment. And uh, I wish John and I could have worked out something, but he never had money to pursue anything bigger than, those kind of films, you know, I don't know how he got the money for last emperor, but somehow he did, but, uh, you know, he couldn't do wall street because of the money. Cause it was just a bigger uh, canvas. Right. It's a shame because I liked a lot of what Orion produced during that period. It's actually some of my favorite films from that period. Really, really good stuff. Um, with Salvador, the reason I like it is because it's everything. It's a comedy. It's a drama. It's a thriller. It's got action in it. It's got politics in it. I mean, and by the end of it, you're crying because, I mean, obviously, you know, too bad for the people who haven't seen it yet, but Jesus Christ. And it sums up the whole book. You're chasing, and you mentioned in the book that you were chasing the light that day. I mean, you can see when, after they arrest them, as the police car is pulling away, the light is going over the, the mountains. It's the last shot. Yeah. I think the last day we were out of money. I don't know what the fuck. It was That's amazing. Crazy. No, it's amazing. The, the tales of making that film, I, I'm, we don't have to get into them. I know you've talked about them before and whoever's, you know, people who are listening, there should, you should read if for no other reason than to just read the chapter from to hell and back. Uh, just the, the, the challenges, the insane shit that you went through, but also more politics because you're in the Philippines. I mean, so boom, you know, you're, you're going back and forth. You're in the Philippines. You're seeing what's happening with Marcos. I mean, there's all of these things are on top of each other as you're chasing this, uh, making these films. You're also getting politicized in the in the midst. And as you mentioned at the end of the book, uh, the, getting the Oscar for Platoon was the sweetest moment you had had since uh, returning from Vietnam. Yeah, absolutely. How do you, because I know we don't even have to go the full. That's why, it's enough to do, that's why it has to end there because you don't want to try to top that. It's just, it will, there's another story now, but. Once you get that dream the first time, it's, it's great. It's nothing better. Yeah. You know, maybe life should stop there. You should die. And that would be nice. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, uh, no, I was a filmmaker. Yes. I had arrived as a writer director, but I was not yet as accomplished a director as I would, as I would become. I was, you know, on a rather primitive level. I told, I said that platoon was primitive, primitively directed. I knew the numbers and I knew the people. I mean, I know the military drill and I had help. And, but it was really, as a fil director, filmmaker, I think Wall Street is a step up and it continues each film to get more sophisticated. Yeah. You can, that, that's, that's very clear. I mean, by the time you get to things like JFK and then Nixon, some of those, yeah. some of those techniques, of course, you, you see coming back and forth. I mean, the, the flashbacks in history, uh, then when they cut to like the black and white shots, you see some of that developing early or like some of the time lapse shots all the way up into then into U-turn and, and any given Sunday where they're used uh, more regularly. And, the, you know, some of my, I think some of the more visually stunning movies that you've made. Um, let me, let me end by, by this, cause we got some time, but I wanted to ask you, um, we can end early. Um, cause I know you're busy and you got shit stacked up in your minds on whatever you got to write or create, oh, yeah, but I, uh, 
I, I'm wondering about your just the general creative process. How do you keep yourself disciplined enough today? You've had success. Uh, now you're at this stage in your life. Um, you know, there's only so many other things you can create. There's only so much time in the day and so on and so forth. How do you keep yourself or is that fire still burning uh, so much that you can keep yourself disciplined motivated enough to continue to to do work and to challenge yourself yeah, and push not yourself so much for feature films because frankly i see movies all i continue to see movies and i appreciate good movies as i as i the the one on chicago seven and so forth i appreciate them but i don't have to do them i don't have to compete i don't feel like yeah i could go and i could jump into a film and kill myself making it it's going to be just another film. I don't know if it's going to change anything from my work, body of work. I really don't. There's not one idea that burns as, wow, that'll be the culmination. I did have a few, but nobody would finance them. So, fuck it, you know. Uh, what was it? David Lean said something very to the point, I think. When he retired for, he retired for about 20 years after, uh, after uh, the Irish film, uh, yeah, about 20 years. And because the critics kind of got him depressed because they gave him such shit for the last couple of films. And he said, he said, basically, what's the point? And what's the point? I think that happens to, to certain people, unless you're, unless you're praised and feel like there's encomiums and there's another mountain to climb. I do. I am very happy with satisfying my intellectual energy with this, documentaries uh, and the book too. Uh, the, the book was an effort, it made a lot of effort, but so are these documentaries, you know, this JFK thing's a bitch. Uh, it's four hours long, but it's really good and it's important that they may not distribute it, who knows with these bastards, but uh, it'll, it's there, nobody's gonna destroy it. Same thing is true about nuclear energy. Uh, this is an important thing and it's very important I do it because I have the capacity to, and the interest but the, as a film maker, I guess I'm not that interested anymore because as, as what's the point? If, no matter how much I try, uh, whether it's Savages or uh, Snowden, it, it's going to be an indifferent response. People don't like me. A lot of people don't like me. And you can feel it in the reviews and this and that. They just, you know, they they ignore. They don't even deal with it. They ignore what I'm how can you not watch Snowden and feel something about, and then the, the easiest way to dismiss it is say, oh, this was done already by this documentary. Well, check out the documentary side by side with the feature. Tell me that they're not wholly different, right. wholly different. Right. People are not very careful about that, but that's par for the game. I mean, it's been like that for years from Wall Street W, the reaction to Alexander, the reaction to, uh, which we were, uh, we watched in our Western civilization course, we had to watch Alexander in our, we watched in university when I went to university, which I dropped out of, but we watched Alexander in our Western Civ course and we watched Salvador in our history of Latin America through film course. So both of your, both of those movies. Where is that school? Uh, Purdue University, North Central. So it's an offshoot campus of Purdue University. That's great. Sounds interesting. No, the Alexander is a very important movie for me in a, Obviously, there's many cuts of it. The last one was the one. And uh, a French critic, uh, a very renowned French movie critic, in, uh, said about it just the other day, he said, this is a great epic with balls that they don't make anymore. A great epic with balls, which is accurate. I mean, I think there's a lot of things we did in that that are ignored. I mean, it's just the critics in this country uh, don't get me. And that's something you have to live with, unfortunately. Uh, I do think there'll be another wave of people like you, people who care. Our professor uh, made us watch it and he said, one of the reasons why I like this so much is because it shows all of the different aspects of Alexander. I mean, all the way into the sexual. I mean, we talked a lot about the sexuality in his class and he was a bisexual guy who was really open about it. Uh -huh. So it was great because it was like, I opened up this whole conversation and at an offshoot university in Northwest Indiana, you could just see these kids heads just exploding. Uh -huh. And he loved the fact that I had come back from the war and we had had, I went to his office hours and we had long conversations about just different things. And 
yeah, it, you know, he, he made that a point. Um, and I thought those kind of epic, big, grand films or even the time. I mean, most of your films are well over an hour and a half or two hours long. And that, I, I mean, today you're lucky if anything comes out that's uh, longer than 90 minutes. I mean, and you can't, for me, it's like, I don't know. It's like fucking, it's like, can you get into it in three or four minutes? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you got to fuck in a bathroom and get it out. Sometimes you can't really get into it, you know, in five or 10 minutes. It's like, you got to, with a two, three hour movie, then you walk away and you feel like you've been through something. Well, the version I like is three hours and 27 minutes. That's the fourth version. It's called the, uh, ultra cut or something like that. Yeah. Is I, as yeah, far as the, as far as the docs are concerned, uh, Oliver, I'm wondering if you feel a certain responsibility. You alluded to it earlier, but because of your position, because you have a voice, um, because you have uh, some kind of material means to make these things or to at least put them in motion, do you feel with the state of the world today that you do have a responsibility, or is it something that you do out of a? Do you feel you have a personal responsibility to make these kinds of documentaries, or a collective responsibility to like the? the country, the society, the world? Well, I think my voice is important as a dissenter. Obviously, I'm in dissent from the mainstream thought process, political process in this country. It's extreme. I'm an international person. My mother, I'm a dual citizen. And I've traveled a hell of a lot. I've seen a lot. So I have to accept responsibility for being alive. And as an alive citizen of this world, international citizen, I wholly disagree with our foreign policy. And a lot of the thinking, political thinking of our country, which I find ignorant and narrow minded. So, yeah, I'm trying to uh, broaden the scope. I mean, listen, uh, the, uh, every documentary has been an eye opener for me in terms of meeting these people and uh, trying to do them justice. And it's not editorializing or hating America. It's opening our minds to other ways of thinking. We have this love of American empire, this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Peter Kuznick and I did untold history together. It's called the exceptionalism. You know, it's not the right word, but America thinks it's different, thinks it's singular historically. And this is all bullshit. And I'm, up, I'm against that thinking because it sets up this mentality that we have the right to tell other people what to do. We don't. So yeah, I fight against that till the day I die. I hate that. I hate that way of thinking. And you know, we saw it last night with Biden and with Trump too. Did something special about America? No. Come on, get off it, man. Yeah. You can be humble in the face of the world and the existence we have. Uh, it could end tomorrow. Yeah. And I think maybe on my my in my lifetime I'm going to witness it, which would be sad because I'd see them people eating humble pie, which would be good for America to eat some humble pie. Yeah. like we did in Vietnam. It's just necessary to wake up. We need a major defeat. I said in the book that very radical stuff I was saying when Salvador came out, remember? Mm -hmm. I said, I think it's going to take mothers going to have to bleed to have their sons killed again, to yeah. know what it means, what they're doing to these countries. Yeah. No, I oh, thought right? the, that passage you, you note from your interview with Alexander Coburn in the book is, no, it's right on. I mean, those are the kind of things that when I, it's tough, man. When you follow U.S. foreign policy and you see what the fuck our tax dollars are doing and you see what this is doing to Yemeni babies and Afghan babies and Syrian babies and Libyan babies and Iraqi babies and Somali babies, and you can go down the list. And if you see enough of those pictures and you read enough of those articles, it'll make you want to unleash some fucking pain on people in this country, carousing around at shopping malls, watching fucking basketball, whatever it is. You get this sense of you just want to go up to Americans and fucking shake them and say, hey, man, snap the fuck out of it. Wake up like a good, you know, slap across the face. Wake the fuck up. You know, I get being even in the political activism, Oliver, it's tough because people always go, hey, Vince, what, what should I do? I say, wait a minute. You need the only fucking goal I have is to get you to think for yourself, think critically, ask big questions and then act on them. You know, I, I don't want you to do what I tell you to do. I don't want you to do what anybody. I don't, I, you know. Think for yourself. Question authority, as your friend Timothy Leary used to say. I mean, that was that's the point of everything to me. Grow, to learn, to seek a higher truth, a deeper truth, a deeper meaning, you know, deeper relationships, better conversations, deeper thoughts, better reflections and insights. I mean, this is pushing yourself, you know, breaking barriers, mental, you know, barriers, spiritual barriers. 
keep moving. You know, let's keep, let's keep growing. Let's keep doing things. And I don't know. It feels like we're at a very dead time right now. You know, that everybody's just kind of like, yeah, that's the way it is. And things suck. And the American dream materialism has kind of captured the spirit. So if you keep, keep the people materially happy, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll line up and sheep. They'll sheep. They'll be sheep. Uh, uh, Goring said that, uh, he says, when he was in prison, he was about to be tried at Nuremberg. He said some comment, that very, very clever. Uh, he said, any, any people, any country can be propagandized into war. Just, you know, you can just announce that the enemy is doing this and this and this, and you have them. And he was very cynical about it. What give, what gives you hope today other than, you know, you said you meet some younger people, you meet people who are doing good work. What what else in, in, that you can people see? Like you. No, people like you give me some hope, but politically, uh, you know, you always look for the bright lights, but uh, I don't see the young politicians in America saying anything about foreign policy or the military. They No one seems to have the guts to line up against those bastards. No. Except all these fucking generals in the Pentagon, we accept all this bullshit. This is what drives me nuts with the squad bullshit. I mean, I like it. I mean, it's better than their, their Democrats who want to cut everybody's benefits, but fuck. I mean, so the, the biggest up and coming Democrats that are out there, AOC, you know, Rashida Tlaib, uh, so, uh, Presley, some of these others, they foreign policy is missing. I mean, they don't even have the kind of foreign policy that somebody like uh, Dennis Kucinich had 15 years ago. Dennis Kucinich had better foreign policy position than the up and coming new progressive Democrats have today. And Bernie Sanders himself said some stupid things. Yeah. That's well, he said some stupid things too. Yeah. No, it's probably the biggest downfall of him. A good, good domestic view of what we should do and, and absolutely no idea of what we should do in terms of the empire. And, but there's also material interest there, Oliver. You got to realize a lot of F-14s built in Vermont. A lot of F-14s. Media so, Benjamin is the best in terms of calling attention to our foreign policy. Yeah. You know, media. Yeah. It's great. She is great. Code, code She's thing. in uh, collective 20. We're in the same writing group together. I'll say hello. I, I love her. I will. Peter told me to say hello to you. And I also just interviewed David Vine the other day and, and what an excellent book, his new book, United States of war. Oh man. It's a whole history of us military bases. It's probably the most comprehensive history of us. Cool. Mil- it's called the United States of war. Uh, by a gentleman by the name of David Vine, V-I-N-E. You won't be disappointed. It's probably the most comprehensive historical look at the history of U.S. military bases, both during... Uh, excuse me? What is it? Who is that David Vine? He uh, teaches... Yeah, he's a professor of anthropology and history at American University. He's a friend of Peter's. Yeah, very sharp cat. I would definitely recommend checking out his work. Well, I've taken your hour, Oliver. I don't want to take any more of your time. Um, It's a pleasure to talk to you, Vincent. Uh, Let's keep up the dialogue and let's try to get to Washington and do something. 